five. Okay, so um, class, I'd like to introduce you to Peter Verhein. Peter is the head of prison, the presentation, the preservation <laughs> department at uh, Syracuse University Bird Library, and um, I have known Peter for a long time. Um, Peter has um, been doing presentations and classes at ALA on, on digital preservation. Um, he has been in this game for a long time, um, very much into the, let's say, the inception of uh, digitization when it really became mainstream. And uh, he has a wealth of experience. Um, he's a great person to know if this is an area of interest for you. And um, Peter, I'm going to let you take over from here. So you can mute me and uh, okay. start with your presentation. All right. So welcome to this um, presentation on digital preservation. Um, Angela, thank you for the introduction. I will say that um, my background is actually rare book and paper conservation, and that's how I came to Syracuse. But when I started out working in academic libraries, my first job was at Yale, and that was in 1991. Digitization was really starting to develop as a discipline in its own right. Um, I went to Cornell in 93, and digitization was actually part of their preservation program there. So I was really exposed to a lot, took workshops, and helped build the digital collections here. I haven't actually been doing much of the digitization work here in recent years, but I'm still very involved. And I'm also very interested in digital preservation as a tool. Um, it is a very much a part of preservation programs. And it's something that we need to keep you know, in, in our minds when we do digitization projects. Um, right now, the standards for actual digitization work have been very well established. Digital preservation is coming along very quickly. But there's still a great need for building awareness about it, for the, re for the tools and resources that are required, and actually developing the programs. Very few places have really firm in-house digital preservation programs. They're all working using different digital preservation tools. But on the in-house side, I don't really see as much happening programmatically as, let's say, with book and paper conservation. Um, I, I, I always start, when I do this presentation, I like to, I call it rock, paper, scissors, along the same lines. And what we have here is we have a cuneiform tablet, a piece of papyrus, and something which you may or may not recognize. But let's go into it, and we'll see what happens. So what is digital preservation? Digital preservation is really the management of digital assets. And those can be digital projects that were done imaging, audio, video, what have you. And the management of those assets over time to ensure their continued accessibility. And that's a really big part of the equation. And you know when we think about the things historically, what do we have? We have you know, the rock part. We have cave paintings. We have stone carvings. We have clay tablets. Um, paper, the word comes from papyrus. It's a, a reed that's beaten into sheets and laid together. We have parchment and vellum. Those are animal skins that were written on. We have rag which was made into paper as we know it now, wood. Um, the brittle book problem is a very real challenge, especially for 19th, early 20th century collections. But we have the standards developed to ensure the longevity of those materials, to preserve them. We can deacidify things. We can reformat them digitally or on microfilm. Microfilm 
um, early film, the quality, especially on the um, filming side, the standards, was a little bit spotty. It's a bitonal process, or it was traditionally, which means it's either black or white, and depending on how it was processed, if you have spots on the paper that we call foxing, those can obscure text if you know, it's the development isn't there to make sure that that's a little less visible. But standards were developed a long time ago to ensure the quality of those. As a medium, microfilm in proper storage will last hundreds and hundreds of years like paper. Um, this, what do these things have in common? That what they have in common is that despite whatever problems there may be with them, they remain readable. And you know, can we say the same thing about digital things that we have created? You know, media and storage devices degrade and become quickly obsolete. There are replacement costs. Every once in a while, you'll see appeals for old hardware or software so that people can read, you know, five and a quarter disks or older. Um, you know, you've got computer punch cards. There's one manufacturer left of those in the country. You have tape, which can degrade. There's a problem called sticky shed with polyester tape. You know, when we're talking about software file formats and operating systems, those can become obsolete. And they may not be backwards compatible. Um, you've got proprietary encoding schema, proprietary hardware. Um, Syracuse in the late 80s, early 90s was actually on the bleeding edge of digitization. There was the Kellogg project which dealt with adult education materials. Large amounts of manuscript materials were digitized. It was a proprietary format. Before that project was finished, the vendor for the hardware and the software went under. The, the media is unreadable, the files were lost. It was a complete waste of time, except for the experience of going through a digital program before people were really thinking about them on a large scale. Files can be deleted. There was an early working group on digital preservation that had a listserv. Those postings were archived and lost at Yale. The archive was able to be recreated later on, but only because one or two of the subscribers from almost day one had kept every single email. You know, when you get into things like web pages, links break. It's a very common problem that we're all familiar with. But, you know, if any of those things fails, that content is gone, possibly forever. What are some of the digital preservation strategies that we have? Um, there's refreshing, which involves periodically moving a file from one physical storage medium to another to avoid physical decay. Um, we all know that CDs do not last forever. Um, there was a project that I was involved with where we got gold CDs, which are supposed to last hundreds of years from the vendor. And when we redid the digital project, moved it into Content DM here, we found that one or two of the CDs were unreadable. That was not good. We had to rescan everything. Granted, in 500 years, who's going to know what a CD is or how to use it? But to have the media break down so quickly was very problematic. You've got migration. Migration involves moving files from one file format to another. So if we talk about imaging projects, TIFF is the standard preservation format for those. JPEG 2000 is more current. It has a lot of the same benefits of TIFF, which mean, the main one being that it's lossless. So you're not, when you compress things, you're not losing anything. After JPEG 2000, something else might come along. So far, TIFF is still the standard, but it's something that you have to remain very aware of, and you don't want to miss any generations. Um, when I was here initially, we did a database in very, very early version of FileMaker. Um, a year or two later, those files were unreadable. 
one of the things that I had done was save it at the lowest common denominator, which at that point was a CSV or a tab file, text-based. We were able to re-import it from there, but the original format that it was created in was lost. And then there's emulation, and that's something that mimics obsolete software and allows it to run in whatever environment you're in. And it's actually very common for arcade games and similar things. It's a way that I can relive my misspent youth um, playing things like Defender or Pac-Man in the original mode. So when we plan for digital preservation, you really need to think about all those different things. And you need to be able to manage each format in an archive. And so you have to think about specific strategies for doing risk assessment. You need to establish policies. And a big part of that will involve working with bibliographers, um, curators. Data curation is a very new field that's growing very quickly. Catalogers, faculty to determine selection criteria for what assets to preserve. Just because storage is cheap, um, doesn't mean that you don't need to be critical about what you're choosing to preserve in a digital environment, you know, just as it would be in a paper-based environment. You really need to incorporate those digital preservation workflows into existing collection development policies, um, you know, on a very basic level, directory structure naming conventions are incredibly critical. You need to address intellectual property rights. Um, you need to document your best practices. You need to develop metadata guidelines. When you have a digital preservation plan, you need to make sure that you review it and revise it on a regular basis. Technologies change, your organizational structure changes. Um, that needs to be incorporated into it. It needs to be a collaborative effort. And a big reason for that is buy-in. Um, you know, it's very easy, especially when you're dealing with things that you can't necessarily see. You know, out of sight is out of mind. You need to make sure that all stakeholders really buy into it so that it does become sustainable. And it requires resources and organizational commitment. And that's really the biggest thing. And everybody really in your staff across the board needs to think about the preservation of those digital assets the same way that they would think about the preservation of the print collection where you know if they're walking through the stacks they see something that's not right they point it out to preservation same thing with digital if you're working you know if you have digital collections and you notice that um, you know something's not working it's missing point it out to someone and that way you can encourage and help make that sustainable. You know, across the board, you want to encourage good habits and standardization, especially in things like file naming and directory structure. And that's something where that collaboration is really, really critical. Excuse me while I um, grab a drink. Go on to the next one. So, you know, preservation storage requirements. Standard backups on the servers are not sufficient for long-term preservation. And that's why we have standards. And one of those is OAIS, which is the Open Archive something or other standard, which ensures accessibility and compatibility. You need to have audit reporting. You want reports on data integrity for everything that's in there. Those would be something like your checksums. And that's something that with our audio materials, we're starting to incorporate into our workflows where we're checking those and um, recording them. You want to have regular backups to multiple physical locations. Um, one of the things that I believe very firmly in is that if an institution is going to digitize its collections, that it has, you know, it owns those. It has the sole responsibility for them, and it really should back them up and preserve them locally. That does not preclude using, thank you, Angela, um, using cloud-based services, but 
at the end of the day, we're still responsible for that. And services that are in the cloud that are vended can come and go. Um, and you need to ensure data integrity. So, you know, that's those are really key concepts. Um, you know, file versioning. You want to save a snapshot of a file at the point that it's amended, it's ingested, if it gets changed, and you want to track those changes and make sure that people can tell what version they're looking at. You want to have migration tools. You don't want to have to go back and, you know, change individual files. You want to be able to do it on a mass scale. So, say, taking all, if you've got TIFF images in there saying that everything that's a TIFF will now be migrated to J JPEG 2000 and apply that to everything that's in your repository. You want to check for schema errors, file format errors, anything that can be you know, introduced during that ingest process. We had in one of our digital projects here when we were uploading files, we had some kind of hiccup and over a sequence of about 20 TIFF images, we were able to see how they started to fuse together and distort. And somewhere on my in my file of, I'll call it my you know my freak show of just problems. I have those. I would wanted to incorporate them, but I for whatever reason can't find them right now. That's a digital preservation problem. And you need to have security so that whatever you have on the servers can't be changed by unauthorized people or systems. It, you Ideally, you want it to be self-healing so the system notices that there was a problem. It compare, looks at what was there, can possibly replace that file from an, with an older version of the same file that has the exact same attributes. And you want to make sure that you're not introducing viruses into the system. And all those things are what we, are what we call attributes of a trusted digital, sorry, of a trusted digital repository or TDR. And, you know, I'm not going to read through all of these, but Basically, they state the obvious, all the things that we need to be doing, and the biggest part of that is the institutional commitment to preserving those assets. Um, if there were more people here, we, you know, I'm sure that we could have some really good discussions about this. Um, so, you know, just to. I'll just go back to the Trusted Digital Repository. But the biggest part of it is the institutional buy-in, that commitment with, at the end of the day with dollars to pay for staffing and to pay for those, for the migration support of those assets. If that goes away, the digital collection can very easily be lost forever. Um, it's a little bit harder with book and paper based collections where you still have the stuff hanging around. Yes, the building can burn down, everything can go up in a puff of smoke, but even if I'm looking at a moldy piece of paper that's been waterlogged, what have you, we can still salvage things. And the digital side, it's a little bit harder. So what we'll look at next are some of the ways, some of the tools that we have for digital preservation. Um, there are cooperative projects, um, Locks and Clocks, which sounds like Dr. Seuss, um, but isn't. Um, Portico, the Digital Preservation Network, that's a new initiative. We have hosted options. Um, the Digital Archive at OCLC is one of those. And then there are tools that can serve digital preservation functions, but are really more designed more as repo institutional repositories. Um, and then an OCLC product, Content DM, which is for delivering digital, mostly image collections. So on the cooperative project side, we have LOX. And LOX stands for Lots of Copies Keep Stuff Safe. And when it was started, at this point, I think it's approximately, you know, might be going on, um, not quite 10 years, 
it's it was a grassroots effort. It's an international community that Syracuse is a part of, and what that involves is that each library has a, a server called the Locksbox, and we download all the content that's in there. And when Lox started, it was focused largely at more open access type of publications, but over time it's taken in print-based publications that have digital content, um, other subscription-based um, digital journals, and what happens it with um, with that content is as a LOX, and I'll get to your question in a second, Angela, as a LOX participant, we agree to copy all that content into our box. It requires a minimum of six institutions to preserve, to commit to preserving a title. And what LOX does is it compares all the people who are preserving that content. It compares their files with each other. And if it detects a problem, it basically takes the content that is still intact and copies it over to the box where there was a data error and replaces that. On our end, it's really not a lot of effort at all to run a locks box. Um, I work with our IT people, and every they upgrade the server as needed, make sure that that's running, and what we have done to basically eliminate the challenge of picking and choosing among titles we want to preserve, we just say we're going to take everything. So every couple of weeks or so, Locks will send out an email saying there are 800 titles from High Wire Press, Francis and Bacon, and some others. And we go into our Locks box and basically select all the titles. Select all is the easiest way to do it. And then it just starts crawling and ingesting. Um, it does check what to see whether we are allowed to ingest that title. So if Syracuse University Library does not subscribe to a certain title, it'll kick back an error message to locks and it'll just skip it. But that is the basic process and you really don't know whether how whether or how it's working because it's insurance policy. But the plan is that if a title if a publisher goes belly up or there's a trigger event which causes people not to be able to access it, that in the system, it'll automatically switch to the locks box and deliver that content to whoever is looking for it. And this software is open access. It's freely available. And you know, it's LOX does has started asking for donations based on how big your library is. But the software itself is free. Um, Clocks is the controlled version of Locks, and it's a joint venture between scholarly publishers and research libraries. It's part of the same initiative as Clocks, as Locks, and the same model. But this is where Locks and Clocks are kind of fusing together, and there's content overlap. Um, but it was aimed more towards working with publishers rather than working with um, the smaller open access kind of organizations, which are a little less structured. I actually, um, for about eight years, published an online open access journal in the book arts, which is a part of the LOCKS project. So I was able to learn how that worked from the publisher's end. And it's it's not terribly automated, but it works and there you know it's there's a lot of communication that goes back and forth. And but it is a very labor intensive process because they need to manually select all those titles. And as publishers we need to submit information to them that so they add it so then the next time a crawl goes out, you find it. I can't, as publisher, automatically add my content. Um, Portico is another project. And basically, Portico worked directly with the publishers. Um, although I didn't address it verbally when I was talking about locks and clocks, um, those will migrate the bitstream of the contents. If you have PDFs, 
it'll continue migrating the PDF format. Um, at some point, it may take that PDF and migrate it to the next format. On the other hand, Portico creates a standard format so that they only have one thing to migrate. Um, that's a really big difference between the two. And Portico is supported by the publishers, but also by the institutions that subscribe to it. And it's largely focused on non-open access. Um, they have both of these initiatives have co collection development missions and they've moved a lot closer together um, and so there's that's a typo on my part should say there's now a great deal of overlap between them but there's also a report that was done by Cornell and Columbia and they you can see there that how few of the e-journals that are actually out there are being preserved by any of those initiatives. Um, when you look at what libraries are holding and what's out there. So it's a very sobering figure. Um, by Angela, to your question, is there a preference among these? Um, basically, libraries are participating probably in all three of them. At Syracuse, we are members of Portico. We're also subscribe, participating in LOX. And CLOX is a publisher thing, so we're not as involved with that. But we're covered by all three of them, more or less. And again, it's insurance, and you never really know how it's going to work until you need it. And so far, we haven't really needed it. But I'm sure that day will come sooner rather than later. Um, the Digital Preservation Network is something that is being developed. Um, Syracuse, through our Dean of the Library, Suzanne Thorne, who's on their board, is going to be involved in that. And the way DPN works is they, what they're using, what they consider the space shuttle model. So in the space shuttle, there were three computer systems that all worked independently of each other. They all did exactly the same thing. They checked to make sure that it was correct. And if one of those failed, you still had the other two systems. So DPN is going to use a combination of Fedora, the, the, the underlying architecture of Fedora, the Hathi Trust, which is the digital preservation repository for the Google Books project, and increasing amounts of other content and the California Digital Library. So if we as Syracuse deposit our materials in this, it will go into the Fedora-based repository, it will go into the Hathi Trust-based repository, and into the California Digital Library-based repository. And those three will check against each other to ensure that that data remains intact and gets migrated forward. It's a lot of redundancy, but you know, redundancy is good, just as with locks. You know, the more copies you have of things, the more likely they are to be preserved. Um, so to get back to you know, digital content and these digital preservation initiatives, digital content becomes available when you have a trigger event. And that is, you know, publisher ceasing publication, a delivery platform fails. So in the case of my e-journal that I published, if I actually have that content, it's in addition to LOX, it's also I have it in the Internet Archive, and Syracuse is hosting it on its content DM. But, you know, let's say the main platform that I'm using is here at Syracuse. If our content DM goes down, then that's a trigger event because it's in locks and the link is to content DM. It should become available through locks when you click on links in the library's catalog and elsewhere. Um, and so that way, hopefully, the user, end user will not be aware of that. And then the systems can come back online if it was a temporary glitch or you just go to permanent delivery via LOX or Portico or DPN in the, into the future. 
Um, the OCLC Digital Archive provides a foundation for the preservation of digital collections. Similar to the others, um, you need to subscribe to it and pay for it. But it's a secure managed storage environment. It automates monitoring and workflows. For those people who are using Content DM, it works seamlessly, so that can be a benefit. And because it's hosted, you don't have to deal with maintaining the infrastructure in-house. There are, of course, flip sides to that. If, for whatever reason, your, you know, the cloud goes down and you weren't backing it up here, you've lost it. One second, please. DuraSpace is something new as well, and that came out of a merger between DSpace and Fedora, which are repository tools. Um, DSpace was developed at um, MIT, I believe, and Fedora was developed at Cornell, and they're basically their institutional repositories is what they were developed as. But over time, both of them, and now as DuraSpace, are becoming a, a, a preservation environment more than a repository where, you know, if we look at Surface here at, on campus or any other institutional repository, it's really, it's a tool for providing access to research and not necessarily a digital preservation tool with all that infrastructure on the back end and organizationally. But it, it can provide that and provide the core of a repository because of the metadata and how it controls that and things like versioning of the documents themselves. So if you have changes, it can you know, keep copies of those going back in time. And you can, you know, if you have a problem, you can always go back. Um, Content DM is a digital Im image repository. We use it here at Syracuse. A lot of other institutions use it as well. And it provides a secure managed environment for a variety of file formats, not just images. So we have PDFs in there. We have sound files in there. But it was originally developed for images. And it works quite well. It's very basic. It's based around Dublin Core. And as you know, you know, Dublin Core is kind of the most basic of the metadata schemas. It can take your master images and create use space images and store those. But again, it's more of a repository and not so much a digital preservation environment. But it can provide the core of one. Um, other institutional repository software, for example, there's BPress Digital Commons. That's what Syracuse uses for Surface. They back up those things. We can get copies of those backups, and we are sto now storing those on our servers. Our repository is about a year, a little over a year old now, year and a half, and it's growing very, very quickly. We're using it for faculty research, publications, presentations, things like that. And, you know, for example, I might take this presentation that I'm doing right now and put it into Surface in order to preserve it, you know, as a backup to what's going to be online in Adobe Connect on the university servers. If they decide they want to go use GoToMeeting, that archive will probably disappear, but this way it will have been preserved in one form or another. Um, this is kind of a schematic of what we are proposing as a digital content management solution for the university. Excuse me. Not just the library, and this is from 2009. Our conversations about this kind of ebb and flow, and we're slowly working towards it by joining DuraSpace. I think we've pretty much made a decision, but we're still going to want to, to my mind, back up things here. But if we look at this, you know, you've got your 
you know, you've broken it down by your stakeholders and your environment. You know, the con stakeholders are the content creators. That's the Special Collections Research Center in, in the library here. That is where the bulk of digitization efforts has been centered. Um, when libraries do digitization, it is generally of their primary research materials housed in special collections. So image collections, um, from photographs, things like that in special collections. Correspondence, um, a really big project for has been the Breuer project. Br Marcel Breuer was an our architect, started during the, a little bit before the Bauhaus period. Greatly influenced architecture throughout the world in the 20th century. We have the bulk of his papers and his plans and his drawings here. We've been digitizing those. That's, you know, that kind of content. The Belfer Audio Archive is where we have one of the largest collections of historic sound recordings in the country, if not the world. We've been digitizing there for about five years now. Um, DISC, which is our digital imaging center, um, that's kind of an in-house operation. They create content for S special collections and other areas of the library. Um, they are Right now, they're also doing a lot of digitization of print-based documents for our institutional repository, Lightwork, which is a photographic center on campus um, next in Watson. That it's not like Photo Center where they go out and take pictures of events on campus, but they do. Um, it's art photography, very important and um, significant projects and um, residencies and things like that from noted photographers. The University Art Collection has a digital archive of its materials and where we have the um, SU faculty and academic programs that's the surface stream. And when we were initially talking about this, there's a c company called EMC, and they have this black box called a Centera, which is huge. And basically, it ingests everything. And you can access it through various delivery tools. It manages its self-healing. If it detects problems, it fixes them automatically. I believe that software would have that box with the software would have cost the library or the university half a million dollars back in 2009 for the kind of content that we were talking about it's not something that um, we went with but then you also have you know the digital the content delivery tools that would plug into that so content dm could have pulled into you know it's pulled the content from it, course reserves um, for our media, streaming server, our repository, we called it eCommons, it's now Surface, but also copyright restricted materials and it can manage and deliver that content to any of our users who are the general public, their students here, their faculty, basically everywhere. Um, so that's, but this is kind, kind of outlines all the different tools that, you know, and sources of content and how you would manage them. And in this, you would be using that OAIS model and seeing how things go. So digital preservation here at Syracuse, we have ongoing image projects. Those rely on established standards. Um, we have ongoing audio preservation at Belfer. We have a studio there, which is part of the preservation department. Um, audio preservation, there are established standards for formats there as well. The preservation format is still a WAV file, but we're also generating MP3s to, for delivery. Um, you know, we're working there with media that goes back to wax and celluloid cylinders. We have discs such as, you know, LPs, 78s. Um, our 78s and our cylinders are where our historic sound recordings are. We have very, very large amounts of magnetic media, audio tape in various formats. Um, you know, everything from audio cassettes to two inch tape, one inch tape, half track, eight track. You know, there's a huge number of formats and those are actually the most endangered because of the deterioration of that magnetic media. But in addition to 
you know, the deterioration of the media, we also have to make sure that we're keeping the equipment, the hardware, to play that back intact and fully functioning. And that's a challenge. And there are things that we can't do. Um, at Syracuse, we are also going into video in a fairly big way. Um, for those students who have been here for a while, you, you may remember that Syracuse has become the home of Ted Koppel's papers, which also includes the entire archive of Nightline and a lot of the raw footage that he filmed for part of some of his um, television documentaries. Um, when we got, we estimate that we're going to need about 2,000 terabytes to store all those materials. Um, that is huge. Um, Indiana University, and you know, there's links here, and you'll get those from the slides that Angela will share with you as well. Um, they wrote a report, a white paper called Meeting the Challenge of Media Preservation. At, at Indiana, they did across campus, they surveyed all the stakeholders, they examined all the collections, and looking at the condition of those materials, the formats that they have, and the rate of deterioration, but also of obsolescence of hardware, they figured that they have 13 years to preserve all that content. And they are going to try to do just that. And that report outlines it. Um, their collections are bigger than ours. Um, in some areas, like the audio, I, I believe that we have more. But they are tackling this on an institutional basis and are going to go hell-bent for leather to preserve all that content. Once they have it all digitized, they'll still need to migrate it and preserve it. but getting it off of those endangered analog formats is critical, especially for things like video and audio that's on tape-based media. Um, what can we do? Here are some of the easy steps. Um, you really need to know what you have. And that's in terms of the content. You know, What are all these digital collections? What is their intellectual significance? Why are you keeping them? You also need to, um, and thank you, yes, do please answer questions, um, ask questions. I see them as they're typing and will answer them verbally. Um, you need to know what you have, and you need to have really good collection development policies in place, as you would with any print-based collections. But you also need to keep track of all the different media types. And on the digital side, there's a huge amount of formats that pop up stick around for a while and go away. Um, you know, let's think about all the, even the social media, you know, archiving the web, that's, that's a huge problem. All the twits and tweets and um, Facebook and things like that. Um, and Alicia, when we're heading towards the end, and feel free to ask, and we can go back and um, answer your question. You need to organize and maintain a, a, a directory structure, just as you do on your PC. Hopefully, you know you need to know where things are stored, and you know organize it in a way that's logical. So, if you've got image files, you may want to have all your TIFF images organized by collection in one directory. All your JPEGs and another, that kind of thing. You want to limit the archival formats to stable and established types. Um, yes, that means you may be hanging on to something that you're not quite sure of for a while, but at some point in time you may need to either say we're going to preserve the bitstream of this and hope that someone can emulate it, or you're going to migrate it to something else and preserve the essence of it. Um, you need to migrate forward or backwards. Um, just as I mentioned a while back with the fi early FileMaker database, go to your lowest common denominator. That could be a text-based table format, like a common delimited or tab delimited um, for that database. But you, know, you may lose a lot of the um, more interactive features, but you're not going to lose your core data. You need to make use of metadata. You need to gather it. If you don't know what something is, you might as well not have it. Um, and it's easier to create, you know, keep track of that metadata when you create it so that you don't have to go back 
sometimes some of the, especially the technical metadata will be embedded in the file when it's created and that helps a lot but you still need to know you know especially if you're looking and we get this a lot with um, images or audio formats you look at something and you say you know I have no you know you have a glass plate negative you see a house you see some water in front of it you have no idea where that house is, what that body of water is, although it's the Erie Canal connection, so maybe somewhere along the Erie Canal, at least you hope so. Um, you need to keep control of the intellectual and physical content. Um, you know, you don't want to, I, I still believe firmly in this, you really don't want to use a cloud-based thing except for access. Um, vendors come and go a little bit too quickly. Um, you want to keep and maintain obsolete hardware as needed because in all likelihood you probably will and you want to find partners to share those resources and costs. I'm um, going to go, um, this is something that I, there's the digital um, Library of Congress has a digital preservation blog and this came across last week. It's called Digital Preservation in a Box. There is, I'm not going to click on it, but you can click on it when you have the slides or through the presentation. But basically, Library of Congress does a lot of outreach to institutions, but also to individuals. And, you know, it's about preserving your personal memories as well as organizational Con assets and they've gathered all those in one place and they're calling it digital preservation in the box it's a lot box it's a lot of resources and links to them at Library of Congress and elsewhere cute little graphic of bits and bytes and ones and zeros um, there's further reading and there's this is there's an article from popular mechanics from a while ago you know, it's, it's written for the layperson, but it really is, um, describes those challenges associated with digital preservation very well. Um, lots and lots of reports. Cornell has an excellent online tutorial on digital preservation um, that grew out of a one-week course. If this is something that you're really, really interested in and will be involved with, uh, I am. I believe it's IMLS, but it's um, is is still funded funded the original workshops, and they're still being taught across the country. Take it. When I took it, it was a one week intensive, at the end of which you your head was spinning, but a lot of it stuck. Um, trusted digital repositories, preservation metadata, and OAIS. Um, you know, for examples of collaborative projects going to Hati Trust and LOX. Hati Trust again is the repository in which the Google Books prod content that was given by libraries is stored and it's a really good resource. And then there's also more digital preservation tools at Fedora and DSpace. Um, and I have there's a libguide, a uh, resource guide for, for preservation in general, but I've linked to a lot of other digital preservation resources and um, from that, so feel free to click on there. And um, let's see what the next slide here is. Okay, that's me. If you need to contact me, I'm here, but what we're going to do now is um, there is a really, really um, digital preservation. Europe has created a series of um, basically cartoons that highlight digital preservation. We'll kind of wrap up this presentation with that, and um, then we'll take some questions. So I'm going to stop sharing um, my screen once I open this up and stop sharing and I'm going to sh share my screen pardon me one second I'm going to go full screen and go all the way back
So that was entertaining. Um, did were you able to? I assume that you were all able to see the video. Um, no audio. Okay. So the link is in the. Um, you couldn't hear. Disappointing. Okay. The link is in the slides, and it should work with the recording as well. But it's at the end, and it's also linked to from the LibGuide. Um, I have no idea why the audio did not work. Um, my apologies. And um, but you know when you click on it in the PowerPoint slides, since Angela has the native slides, um, that video will pull up and you will get the full audio. But basically, what it did was kind of provide a silly scenario of digital preservation being applied and how it works. Can nobody can hear? Okay, great. You can hear. Um, you couldn't hear the video. Okay, so you know, an, another joke. Who knows what's the def what's the definition of metadata? Anybody know? A word with eight letters. So. This, um, I mean, this concludes this presentation. So, if you have any questions, please type them. And um, actually, what I can do is I can just switch you all to audio. And hang on, since there's not many of you, um, enable audio, enable audio, enable audio, enable. Audio, enable audio, enable audio. So all your audio is now enabled and theoretically you should be able to ask them verbally as well. Um, Alicia, you had a question earlier on and I see Mia is typing.
Peter, can you hear me? I can. You're still here. Okay, so we have a question from Mia who's wondering how new digital repositories create the fields and the elements as Dublin Core allows. Um, basically, Dublin Core, you can determine the fields that you need. The only one that's really required is title. But with, with um, any kind of metadata, those, the needs of you know, what fields you need are dictated by the content that you would have. So a really good starting point is looking in a library catalog even to see what is what are the fields in a MARC record. So who are the people who are involved, who are speaking, um, who, Lysia still can hear, okay. Um, sorry. Um, who can um, the field? You know, who, the, who's the creator, the publisher? Um, what's the description of what's on the image? So, what you know, if you're talking about digital images, what are the attributes? So, saying that this is you know the Garrett Smith Farm in Peterborough, New York, and the Erie Canal is flowing past it, which it doesn't, but that's beside the point. You know. It's, it's really, it's dictated by the collection. Then you've got all the technical metadata, which says that this is a, a TIFF image at 600 DPI scanned with, processed in Photoshop, what have you, whatever you feel you need to include. It really does vary. Um, in terms of Arden's question, how often do we check our local files, how thoroughly? Um, right now, we're relying a lot on the fact that they are backed up, that w those backups um, are checked. Again, as I said, we're all, in terms of the digital preservation and really checking files, it's something that we all need to feel our way into. Um, you know, we haven't, in terms of the images, the standards that we applied haven't changed yet. and you know, we need to, we haven't really had to take the TIFF images and migrate them. We haven't had to do that with the WAV files. I have no doubt that that's going to happen fairly soon, maybe the next five to ten years. Um, but until then, it's, it's just basically monitoring. Um, in terms of, you know, do, do we do user testing of customized metadata fields? Um, you know, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. When we, you know, when we just select the fields, we try to approach it from a user's end as well as from a manager's end to say, what do people need in terms of metadata to find our content, and what do we need to be able to manage the assets? Um, and that's a collaborative process. Um, I hope that answers the question. Other questions? Um, in terms, you know, the present, the decay, actual decay of things. No, we don't really have a schedule for checking those, but, um, you know, when I started doing these things here, I came to Syracuse in 1995, our IT department was saying, you want, you know, CDs are a preservation medium. And as I learned fairly early on with the project where we had corrupted CDs, um, that was in 1999, they're not. And one of the strategies that we thought about employing, but we're never really able to do for whatever reason, and you know, you know, the old saying goes, "The road to hell is paved with good intentions." Um, but you could put, if you cataloged the media, even in your mar you know, in your regular library catalog, just putting a flag into it where, at regular intervals, let's say every year, it just says, "Do random check of these files." 
um, to make sure that you can still read the disk. In the case of the f content that I had, the disks were still readable, but it was selected files on those disks that were starting to break down. So, you know, and at a certain point, you have to rely on automated tools, and that's where things like checksums come in and develop, you know, writing a script that will do that automatically for you. Anyone else? Um, how often does Syracuse review its digital preservation plan? Um, I will say that, like many places, most even, it's probably, it's um, like the Facebook status, complicated, by which I mean it's in process. Um, it's something that we are working on developing in fits and starts. Hopefully when this Duraspace, um, I mean, DPN, comes along, which DuraSpace is also part of, um, we will start to manage things a little bit more regularly, but it is something that we need to do, especially as we now have a real critical mass of content that we are preserving. And it's getting rather complicated when we start digitizing Ted Koppel's materials en masse, which we promised to do when we accepted the collection. That's really going to push us over the edge in every respect. Um, storage requirements, metadata requirements, delivery requirements, you name it, and we need to preserve it. And, you know, you all have audio enabled, so if you want to ask questions verbally, we can. Otherwise, if there really isn't anything anymore, we can wrap it up. Okay, when it comes to supporting old hardware, what is our cutoff point? Um, we are dependent on our IT department for our computer hardware and software. Um, we are fairly up to date on just about everything um, in terms of the software that we use. You know, like Photoshop, we update that. Again, the file formats. Um, the TIFF images and things like that, those are standard. The old hardware, um, we have not really made a concerted effort here to preserve that. I think it's on the computer side, it's probably something where we'd have to rely on a vendor or cry out across campus and say, hey, who's got you know, a five and a quarter floppy drive? Um, interestingly enough, um, in special collections, we, we, and university archives is the same, we start to um, get things where there are floppies included. There was, um, I had a, on an old computer of mine, I had a five and a quarter, three and a half inch combo drive. And when I got rid of that computer, I pulled the drive because I thought it might be useful at some point in time. And then probably about five, six years later, I was cleaning out stuff. I ditched it. A, a week or so after that, at work, we had a call for a five and a quarter drive, and I didn't have it anymore. So live and learn. But it is a problem. And on this side, for analog medium, media such as you know videotapes, audio tapes, that's something that we maintain. And it's, you know, it's becoming harder and harder to get. There are no manufacturers for it. But you know, that's where you have things like eBay and Craigslist if you really need to find things. And, but you know, a real challenge in terms of education is also having people who know what that is. And you know, your class looks, when um, Angela sent me the list, looks like it has a diverse range of students in terms of also age. Um, you know, I'm 50 years old. I remember eight-track tapes, audio cassettes, reel-to-reel. -reel. I still have six feet of vinyl in my basement. I have a turntable. 
but you know a lot of today's kids and I have a 14 year old she doesn't have a clue about any of those things so you know if she were to go into this field and then be confronted with audio tape it could be a real challenge and that's where knowing what you have is going to be really really critical um, it looks like everybody's dropping out so why don't we wrap it up unless anybody else has something I see Arden typing but I'm not seeing Arden's typing um, so okay anyone else um, my contact information was at the end of the slides if you have questions in the course of this class um, you know ask Angela ask me I'm available if you're local in Syracuse my office is in the basement of Bird Library give me a jingle we can set up a time and everybody have a good evening and thank you very much for attending and I will send I will save this recording and share it with Angela and she will share it with all of you. Um, take care and have a good night.